Hello and welcome to Scottish Planner Live, a series of 10 short online sessions running this week, uh, a transformation of what would have been the, the previous RTPI Scotland annual conference. This uh, whole week we're looking at how planning can um, create the kind of healthy places that we are needing across Scotland and today's session is specifically looking at how planners develop more resilient communities um, and housing. My name is Irene Butiman. Uh, I'm convener of RTPI Scotland and I work across local government and in Public Health Scotland as well. So um, this is a topic very close to my, my heart. Um, our guests today, who will be, uh, I'll be introducing later, um, come from a, a broad range of sectors and experience. And I think that's fantastic to get that, that perspective and to drill down a little bit more on the, the strategic level of conversations that, that we had yesterday. So I will be being joined by Heather Claridge from Architecture and Design Scotland. Um, Heather has a strong background also in uh, local government, working in the City of Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, City of Edinburgh, Glasgow City Council, apologies, that's a nice combo though, um, and on a secondment at the moment to Architecture and Design Scotland. Um, Tammy Swift-Adams um, from Homes for Scotland will also be joining us again with a background in public sector and, and um, national park background and now working in Homes for Scotland. And then finally, um, we're also joined by Sean Andrews um, from Nexus Planning, um, who's also stemmed from a, a public sector background and into private sector. So a good, a good mix of perspectives and experience to, to share on this particular topic today. Our programme for the week is looking at the, the connections that we can make across um, planning and local government and health practitioners and it's also drilling down into some of the specific topics such as today around communities and housing. We'll also be looking at, at active travel, 20 minute neighbourhoods this afternoon um, and, and then looking at the kind of evidence and the link ups that we need um, later on in the session all there on the RTPI website for, for further details. Um, a little bit of reflection so far far um, yesterday, uh, delighted that we, we shared and I, I would hope we could all maybe share. We heard from Angela Scott at Aberdeen um, CEO and, um, and she shared her road for Damascus moment about where planning sits and how important it is to health and it was when she realised that within public health their defined social determinants of health are the conditions and circumstances in which people live, work and play. And all of us sitting in planning go, hey, that's that's what we do. That's that's our concern as well. So that for her was her moment. I wonder if we all need to share that a little bit more, that we have that, that shared ambition. We also, um, I'm delighted, heard from Sue Bridges, the president of RTPI. Um, and, and she shared how RTPI believe that we should be in Scotland working around a set of place and health themes in the national planning framework in order to embed that joined up working. And, um, and shared some very useful insight into the need for that kind of sweet spot between getting density right as we move forward, that detail in order to have the mix of land uses and the connections that, that create these better places. Overall, we, um, we had very strong support from the Minister saying that he very much wanted to support planning to uh, be in a better position to create these healthy communities and right down to the detail of giving 100% support to the development of 20 minute neighbourhoods. Um, we also heard from Claire Sweeney from Public Health Scotland um, being very clear about her desire for more partnership and more joined up working and that they should be a point of contact and want to be involved in, in stronger partnership and collaboration with local government and with planning authorities in particular. They see that link and they have been working on that link for years. So there's a real um, desire there in a new organisation with, with staff who've been there for years to link up. So that leads us really very much then into today and the reflections that we get from our speakers is, is drilling down into all of those higher level messages that we got yesterday. 
Um, for each of you, um, as you're listening to the presentations, there will be then a, an opportunity for questions um, in the latter part of today's session. That will go very quickly from experience, so if you have questions, then please do enter them in to the questions box that will come up on your screen um, as you're listening, because um, time does run away with us all the time, so I urge you to do that. Um, my final thought as we, as we move forward is that everything we're talking about today um, and all week about place uh, is about place. Planning and health come together in a place and we do so many interventions into that aspect of a place that is the physical environment and we do it because we know that that links to people and how they behave and it links to our economy, how we invest, how people work. We are aware of that and our, our interventions are designed to improve circumstances around that for the people of Scotland. The health inequalities in Scotland are immense, 22 to 26 years of healthy life expectancy depending on where you live. So we're not saying that everybody in Scotland is suffering um, from poor health, but there is massive inequality and we have the poorest health record in the whole of Western Europe, which is pretty abysmal really. So that's the focus for where we move forward from to see what more can planning do to make sure that our interventions are all stemming to positive in intended consequences because at times we have unintended consequences of, of how we intervene into environments. Um, so place-based working is about making sure that we link up with everybody in an environment and in the many, many different places of Scotland to ensure that we're aware of the consequences of our actions and we don't have any unintended ones that are leading to the issues around obesity, depression, lack of community, that we're taking all of those into account and working collaboratively particularly with our colleagues in health and community planning. So, without further ado then, I shall pass over to our first speaker, um, Heather Claridge. Um, I was checking Heather on, on LinkedIn and uh, delighted to find that she's a fellow woman of influence um, this year. Um, I think there's only th three of us in Scotland, so we're a very small band and let's, uh, let's up that for next year in our, our nominations. Um, so as I say, Heather is on a secondment to Architecture and Design Scotland, um, but works within the Development and Regeneration Service of Glasgow City Council and has been there for a number of years, so a strong background in, um, in development planning and regeneration. Heather, um, welcome and I pass over to you to share your, your thoughts on today's topic. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Irene. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yes. Um, yes. Delighted to be speaking um, at uh, the, this conference online. Um, so, how do planners develop more resilient communities and housing? Well, to answer this question, I thought I would start with a quote from one of my go-to books, Happy City by Charles Montgomery, who said, we need to listen to the parts of ourselves that are more inclined towards curiosity, trust and cooperation. This resonated with me and my approach as a planner, so I'm going to use it as a lens to explore how we deliver places that are more resilient. Where we spend our lives matters. We know this as planners. Most recently, COVID-19 pandemic has brought into sharp focus our quality of places. It has demonstrated what communities could be like when streets are reclaimed, um, when traffic reduces, pollution levels drop, and we live more locally. But it has also exposed existing place deficiencies disconnected from facilities, a lack of essential services and poor quality of environment. Before COVID, we were already living in an era of crisis. Our wider health and well-being in place were a growing concern, from ageing demographics to social isolation to high levels of obesity, like Irene mentioned. The impact of unmitigated climate change were causing unprecedented damage to our properties infrastructure and livelihoods and the need to embed resilience in our places is not new but how we harness these drivers is a curious challenge of our time. In developing more healthy resilient places one of the key areas of focus of planning must be climate change. It impacts almost every aspect of our lives 
and will continue to shape our future investment plans. By adopting a whole place approach to the net zero carbon challenge, we are able to plan for changes that support the combination of reducing, repurposing and absorbing carbon, as well as adapting to climate impacts. By adopting this approach, we are able to consider different ways to address all scopes of carbon emissions and the impact of climate change in each and every place, in turn generating cool benefits such as cleaner air, healthier neighbourhoods, stronger local economies and diverse environments for people and nature. This will involve shifting our reliance from carbon intensive developments, services and modes of transport to more carbon conscious interventions, encouraging the joining up of systems such as travel, heat, landscape, water and waste, prioritising the reuse and repurposing of buildings and considering whole life costs and supporting more opportunities to share services and assets locally, leading to greater self sufficiency <laughs> Equally as important as understanding the key issues and opportunities is the process of designing resilient places. The approach needs to be collaborative and start with an understanding of the place objectives. What kind of place do we want to be? And we need to ask and engage lots of people in this. Through testing out different scenarios, uncertain future trends are able to be explored and considered. And by embedding collective priorities into plans means a shared place brief can be implemented and monitored by many. Testing out different scenarios to help deliver more resilient places can be undertaken collaboratively. In Strathard earlier this year in Loch Lomond in the Trussex National Park, we created two timelines to 2050 to illustrate two alternative futures. Scenario one showed inaction to climate change, resulting in a place which could only support the fortuned few and scenario two, which embedded climate action into its plans, was able to support a sustainable growth of population. By getting different stakeholders to consider these scenarios as part of the plan making process, we were able to bring together a diverse range of interests from the community, the businesses, tourism, landowners, foresters and housing providers, and instill resilience thinking at an early stage in the plan making process. A frequent challenge we face as planners in collaborative process often lies where there is no immediate community to involve in developing the master plan. In Lerwick, through the NAB redevelopment, they had the challenge of creating a new community on the edge of the town centre on a large former school site. We used a series of personas as a way to bring different community partners and councillors together to think about the priorities of the place. This helped bring to life the experience of the early residents will have as the development is built out over the next 10 years. For example, the critical decisions that need to be made post master plan. If the access, transport, facilities or green infrastructure is not delivered in advance or as part of the early phases, of housing. Will these people really develop healthy low carbon habits? Agreeing place priorities was critical in Lossiemouth when the community were faced with the news that their much loved beach bridge access would need replaced and they would be without access for at least a year. We worked with local stakeholders to think about what a year in the life of this place would be like leading them to explore how they become more resilient as a community and network of community groups. <laughs> Using the place brief to monitor outcomes is also an important part of the process of developing resilient places. In Fraser Avenue in Inverkeething, as part of the Housing to 2040 programme, the place standard was used to assess the impact of good planning and partnership working. The aspects of, aspects of working with the community, street naming initiatives and skills and jobs have led to a more resilient 
happier, healthier place for its residents. We currently have a great opportunity through planning reform and the different scales of plan making in Scotland. The range of expertise and stakeholders who will be involved in shaping these um, should be reflective of the whole place approach. How will we move about? How will we work? How will we green up our communities? And how will we connect to one another? But sitting below our statutory plans are a range of design tools which can also create certainty, resilience and better place outcomes. And we should be using these to, to tools to develop trust with a wide range of people interested in a place. Alongside the plans and to design tools which sit within the remit of planning, there are a range of strategies which planners can contribute to. Our skills in supporting a whole place approach, using data, thinking spatially, thinking at different scales and along different timelines can help build and develop better cooperation and in turn deliver more resilient places. We need to embed place thinking and the place principle into all the plans that shape our neighbourhoods. So three final so thoughts to end on. If planners are to develop more resilient communities and housing, we need to remain curious. We must work with others to explore what kind of place we want to be. How can we address climate change? How can we plan for different people and different futures? And how can we do this at pace? We need to develop trust with those with an interest in place. We need to identify what techniques and tools can be used at the right stage and right scale to unlock sh better shared understanding of real priorities. And finally, we need to set out how we will work with others in a whole range of ways and remits to build more cooperation within and out with the planning system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, really interesting insights there into, um, well, particularly looking at, uh, at the likes of Lerwick on the edge of a town centre as we have the, the town centre review group and how do we move forward and the, the requirements for a, a 20, cent, 20 minute neighbourhood to be considered by that group. Then looking at sites that are on the edge of town centres and their contribution and seems absolutely perfect timing and uh, I'll be sure to raise it with them this afternoon when I have the next meeting. So thank you very much for that insight. Um, I'm going to go straight to Sean Andrews um, from Nexus Planning in the, in the London office and I just wanted to read out something that uh, that is on Sean's um, LinkedIn page. This will be when Sean goes, did I write that? I don't remember. <laughs> Darn it. But uh, he does actually say, you know, he's an advisor on real estate projects. But what I like is when people say what they have a passion about. And you say that, Sean. So you say you have a passion about creating places where human beings thrive. That's right back into those social determinants of health. Um, that was what we were being pointed to um, yesterday. So, Sean, if you'd like to share your thoughts on um, building resilient places um, in order to have resilient communities, I'll pass over to you now. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that. Um, and good morning, everyone that's uh, involved today. Um, so just a, a really quick intro. I'm Sean Andrews. I'm an executive director at a planning consultancy called Nexus Planning. And we are um, shortly to launch a new venture um, called Nexus Resilience, which is a collaboration of urban planners, health scientists, system thinkers and nature based designers. Um, and our, our maxim, if you like, is resilient places build resilient people. And I think that very much talks to, to what has been said um, already. Um, what drew us together really uh, was some shared beliefs um, that the built environment has a powerful effect uh, on our health, that the science is compelling and getting stronger every day, uh, that we can positively improve health through consciously shaping our built environment. But of course, the opposite is true too. Um, and really, I suppose, a growing need for a more human-centric or health-centric approach 
to urban planning and design is, is, is what's needed. So um, health has quickly risen to the top of the agenda under COVID, and it's, it's likely to stay there, isn't it? Um, however, its definition often evades us. Good health depends on a range of factors, but our habitat is, is really key. So many great advances have been achieved by planning, um, by the built environment sector, y yet COVID has exposed major weaknesses in our social, our physical and our community infrastructure. Health has historically been at the centre of urban policy, but is that still the case? And in our drive to meet targets and create dense urban areas, are we also creating healthy places? I think it's pretty clear that cities and towns are the solution. Uh, they are the most sustainable way in which large numbers of people can live and, and, and work together. But um, as someone who's based in, in London, um, appreciates this as, as much as anybody, as anyone, densification can often outstrip our ability to provide the necessary infrastructure, sometimes resulting in cramped and polluted places that can trigger health issues. And the evidence is, is, is now inescapable. Cities have a higher rate of most mental health problems compared to rural areas, including almost 40% higher uh, risks of depression. Planning is a catalyst for greater resilience. However, it's, it, it's, it's been too slow to react. It's notoriously laggy, as I would call it. Um, and this is a major problem. The speed and flexibility is more crucial, uh, I think, than ever. We need a more agile planning framework with smart, locally specific plans and strategies that are quick to develop uh, and quick to change. Um, the really good news is, and we'll come on to this now, is that um, you know, the science and the tools are now there to create places that are optimum for a person on both a neurological and a psychological level. There's been and are many advancements um, in the way, ways in which we, we look at urban health. Um, this is an example from our partner at Centric Lab. They've developed the Urban Health Index, and this is a tool for um, determining areas of health risk by looking at a range of stressors. It calculates um, a stress risk score by looking at things like air, light, noise, thermal pollution levels. Uh, and it also weaves in psychosocial stresses such as crime, access to health and services, education and housing. So if you live in, a, in an orange to red area, it means you're exposed to comparatively high levels of environmental and psychosocial stresses. So this tool enables a conversation really on how to, how to approach making a healthier environment in a more accessible and holistic manner. And it provides some material, some evidence for further investigation on the, on the activities and infrastructure that inhibit or enable uh, healthy living um, in, in that given area. When there are um, multiple complex problems to solve, it's a good rule of thumb, I think, to find the unifying nexus between them. So air quality, for me, is it, just that. Um, putting better air quality at the core of a planner's purpose will solve many of the, the worst problems, I think, facing uh, urban areas. This, this is, of course, um, the Olympic Village in Stratford, and it's one of the healthiest neighborhoods in London. Got low air pollution and noise and heat due to the vast amount of, of blue and green infrastructure that's been planned there. It's also one of the most socially democratic open spaces enjoyed by families, children, and the, the elderly, and from, and from all backgrounds. It's a very open, it's a very open place. 
Working as part of uh, Nexus Resilience, we've been looking at some of the key drivers for healthy, resilient places. I'm not going to go through these in detail, you'd be pleased to hear, but these are some of the items that we look at when, when we look to understand the baseline of a place. So these can include mass transit, housing design, self-sufficient neighbourhoods, ecological systems, microbial health, climate resistant tech, uh, air quality regs, construction supply, uh, or clean, trying to, trying to introduce a clean construction supply chain, and anti-racist and anti-classist um, frameworks. Linked to air quality is the fact that we have a nature deficit disorder in many of our urban centres. Even some of our best known retail streets had issues, whilst being one of London's most uh, well known retail destinations. Regent Street is heavily trafficked, although this picture doesn't seem to show that. It must have been taken at the one time of the year that, that, that it isn't, um, but it's normally very trafficked, as, you, as you'll know, and largely devoid of green. Uh, or, or blue infrastructure. The basic principle of biophilic design is that we are drawn to nature because it regenerates us. And scientific evidence and common sense screams that we need to urgently connect with nature. Uh, being in nature mediates the stress response, which can help bring the body back to um, biological stability, and that in turn can can help reduce the acute systems, sorry, the acute symptoms of mental disorders such as depression um, or, or anxiety. So one of the things we've been considering is could a high street park become a reality? Funding is obviously a challenge right now uh, and reducing traffic in some of these locations is a major hurdle and, and not always the right solution too. However, perhaps there is an affordable uh, pop-up try before you buy option. We're in discussions with horticultural therapist Michelle Brandon uh, around the feasibility of a mobile forest. After learning about her, uh, her, her work, which is award-winning and called the, the Forest Will See You Now, um, if successful, uh, these sorts of ideas could become the catalyst for, for bigger plans. So, um, and finally, my final slide. So zooming back out, if you like, to local resilience planning, what are the what are the next steps, key steps, if you're currently looking at an existing urban area or imagining a new place? So I would suggest um, the following, really. Step one, establish a baseline through the combining of, of health, climate, uh, and, and natural infrastructure data. Uh, review the local capacity and governance in an area to deliver change. Um, model, model the options, uh, look at uh, potential funding, and then finally arrive at the optimum solution or strategy and embed this in, in your policy or in your project. So that's it from me. Hopefully that um, built on some of the conversations that you've already been having and um, I'll hand you back to Irene, I think. Lovely, thank you so much, Sean. An interesting perspective there about putting air quality at the centre to give a kind of unifying focus. Um, I can see that, I can see the sense in that actually, because if you start to put air quality as a focus, then you are looking at reducing as many cars in an environment. So that means you're starting to look at how you could reallocate space in our towns and cities to create those those green spaces and those open, green, grey, blue, whatever, those spaces for actually people to sit and, and appreciate nature and the outdoors. Um, so yeah, that's that's an interesting one there. Thank you. I'm going to move straight on, given our time, um, to Tammy. Uh, Tammy, uh, as I said earlier, Tammy's got a background in both UK government, um, local government in England, and the Park Authority down there. But um, of more pertinence today is that Tammy's also Director of Planning in Homes for Scotland. Um, so Tammy, can I pass over to you to share your thoughts on achieving resilient communities and housing? Thank you.
Hi. I don't have slides, so I'll just talk to you for a few minutes and um, apologise for that in advance. Um, looking at resilience, um, I started by looking in my dictionary about what resilience actually means before I, before I went off on a tangent. And it told me it's the act of rebounding or springing back, or it's about elasticity and the power of resuming something's original shape or position. Um, and I wondered whether as planners, we're starting from a position of really knowing what resilience means to us, we're obviously learning about that today, um, or whether it's a, another concept at the moment, sort of intangible concept, that the type of thing that we tend to feel is inherently what planning is about, like urban design in the past or, or like place, but that we might find it hard to square off with the sort of day job, arguably more mundane aspects of planning. As a starting point, I thought that maybe planning for resilience means planning well all the time, um, facilitating what's needed so that it arrives on time and so that when communities go, do go into a period of shock, like all communities have done with the COVID-19 pandemic, they know inherently where they want to spring back to. They've got a good starting point. They want to recover rather than having to grapple with the added challenge we've got at the moment of trying to bounce back to something better than the place we came from. And to try and break down resilience into just a few minutes, I've sort of taken an acrostic approach, a poetic approach, I guess, looking at the, the different letters of the word and, and trying to find something in the concept in each of those. So starting with R, I looked at um, R being for ratios, house price to workplace based earning ratios or affordability ratios for short. Since the shortfall of homes remains one of Scotland's biggest challenges. Whilst young people can't afford to buy decent accommodation of their own in many parts of the country, homeowners in the same areas have accrued quite a lot of property wealth as demand for homes consistently outstrips supply. And the planning system in itself isn't the problem there, but the way we choose to plan can be part of the problem. And that's what we really need to challenge ourselves on. Planning authorities a core part of their purpose or the core part of the role they've taken on is to ration housing land and they do that as a means to an end with the end being sustainable development or sustainable growth but when we look at how we judge the performance of planning it's not necessarily whether or not we've achieved sustainable development that we look at we look I mean, in terms of housing land at the moment the prime measure of performance is whether enough land has been allocated on paper so in theory, could enough homes be built on the land that planners have identified? And then um, that in itself doesn't really doesn't really add value to anything. I've thought about whether maybe affordability ratios themselves should be a measure of the success of the performance of Scotland's planning system. We recently at Homes of Scotland, and this was part of the work we did for the response to the current Scottish Government consultation, we recently looked at where in Scotland planning appeals had been allowed for housing sites of 10 or more homes since the presumption was introduced six years ago. And there's relatively few. There's 37 of over 150 presumption appeals over that six, six year period. And they've delivered 8,000 homes, including an estimated 1,600 affordable homes. So those are all homes that it's worth Scotland having, given that we've got a much larger plan-led housing shortfalls at the moment. But it's surely not enough of a volume of homes to render the presumption in favour of sustainable development um, too big a monster. Planning authorities where some of those appeals have been um, allowed include some of the most inaffordable and affordable places to live in Scotland. Then I think the, the place with most appeals allowed was Edinburgh. Edinburgh had seven. And East Lothian had six, if I remember rightly. The medium house price ratio in Edinburgh is um, 6.8, and in East Lothian it's 7.9. They're both very, very high and make affordability very difficult. And there's different ways a planning authority can react to that if it's consciously thinking about that as something it, it might be able to help with. What East Lothian's done is it made a conscious choice in its last plan to release a generous supply of new land. Um, Edinburgh is further behind on the preparation of it, its current LDP, but it's currently proposing to restrict development to existing brownfield sites. There's wider planning reasons for that, but thinking about housing delivery, affordability and the resilience aspects of that 
you know, we, we should really think about which approach is more likely to, to be successful on those policy aims. Okay, E is for the environment. We all know sustainability has got three pillars of which the environment is one. I think I'm probably not the only planner <laughs> who's heard it said that we are better as a group, as a profession, at understanding the environment and taking on that challenge than the other two. I mean, some parts of Scotland, I mean, the UK at large, are specifically allocated as national parks, and those areas have statutory aims that are all encompassing, but which, which naturally have um, a heightened sense of the environment in its widest form. Um, I've worked in, in a national park before, as, as Irene said, and it does really help guide you as a planner and as an authority in, in what you're ultimately trying to achieve. Um, but planning at large in Scotland's now got a statutory purpose thanks to the, the RTPI and the new Planning Act of last year, um, which gives all plan makers a duty to manage the environment and the use of land in the long term public interest. Sorry, manage the development and use of land in the long term public interest. And the environment obviously is a part of that, but so too are social economic challenges. So that brings me on to S, which is for social conscience. I'm um, quite enthused by that new statutory purpose for planning because I think it provides a real opportunity for us to think really hard about how the long-term public interest is being served. There used to be a written and it seemed quite well established tenet of planning that it was about the public interest, not the private interest. And I remember in another previous life when I was a civil servant, we'd roll that principle out quite a lot when we were responding to letters to the ministers from people who thought that they should be compensated in some way for various assaults and evidence to solve that they thought the planners had made on their property values. And I do worry at the moment that we've maybe lost our hold on that idea a bit, you know, with, with anti-planning and um, anti-development campaigning coming to the fore so much. I feel like planning at times becomes more occupied than it should be about satisfying the people that are complaining about it or about planning and planners, planning authorities themselves. That's something I've felt in the current current Scottish Government consultation, for example. And, and the problem with that is it's not the job of individual citizens to care about the long term interests of, of the public at large in Scotland, but it is the job of the planner and the authority and the Scottish ministers. And people would happily lead you all off course on that at times. Um, and the next letter in resilience is I, which stands for I. We all hear the word I a lot in planning. For example, I want to buy a house in a town that I grew up in, but despite earning a good wage, I can't afford to. Or I think too many houses are being built and I don't see the need for them. And both those eyes should express their opinions, but they need different responses from planners and the system. The I that can't afford to buy a house needs the planning system to be more successful at stabilising housing land prices and in the longer term house prices themselves. That is really difficult, but I think, for example, it's something the Scottish Land Commission's are looking at, which will be interesting to, to get involved in over time. And the I that probably has a home of their own already and is perplexed by the changes they see around them and the volume of house building that's happening in some places, they need the planning system to be better and more um, bolder at articulating why we need more homes and other development and the role that planning plays in either making situations like the housing crisis worse or better and it might be that that I when they've had the explanation from the planners just doesn't care and that's fine because it's not their statutory duty to care about the public at large but it is it is planning purpose planning's duty L is local development um, plan Tammy I'm sorry but I am going to have to I'm a little we're, we're wanting to have time for questions that's all my apologies but keep going just a little quicker um, and, and we all want a plan-led system but even in a plan-led system it's about where the plan leads us not the plan itself and planning reforms seeking to steer planning authorities towards more effective plans that are collaborative evidence-based and deliver enough homes I'm skipping over I because we've already had two eyes earlier. E was for the economy and about recognising that Scotland is a free market economy. The purpose of planning to an extent is to intervene in that. By, and it does that by restricting the supply of land. We just need to be conscious basically that the more we restrict land, the more we drive the prices up. 
and the less flexibility there is in any development to deliver across a wider range of public policy aims. Um, N was negativity and about trying to turn planning stakeholders frowns upside down basically. As a part of the community of planners I'm always amazed by how much positivity planners keep up um, and that's often in a barrage of negativity not just when you're sitting at your work desk but when you're having any conversation with friends or family about what planning is, what planners should and shouldn't be allowed to happen. I was going to refer to a headline I saw on Planning Online last week, which was Generic admits council planning departments need more money for reforms, which is a nice idea. It's not something we've seen as a headline here, but I think it's an important thing to think about because whatever the aim of planning reform, the planning authorities that the government relies on need resources to do the job well. You can't change the outcomes of planning just on goodwill or just on planning fees. And I'm going to finish on <laughs> the next one. Um, C, I'll finish on, I was going to say C is about can-do attitude, not just concepts, and I think probably everything I've said explains what I mean there. We can tackle with ideas like resilience, but we need to know all the components of making somewhere resilient. We need to understand what is the negative impact on achieving resilience or place or whatever we're trying to do of continuing to deliver too few homes through the planning system. I'll miss out all my prog rock concept album jokes. <laughs> Lovely, thank you so much, Tammy. And and actually, a very good point that you you end on there around those needing to understand so that we know the the consequences of what we're doing at the moment and those unintended consequences that may be negative or, or positive. Um, I'm going to go straight into questions, please do feel free to write them in, but I'd already had one submitted to me around um, what, is, what is stopping us from building resilient places and housing, and I'd like to put that in the context of something that, that Heather said around using the place um, standard themes as well, because um, both RTPI and Public Health Scotland are are doing work promoting the use of those themes as a way of giving consistency in a national planning framework so that every local development plan across Scotland has a consistent set of themes to almost begin embedding that health in all policies immediately. And, and I wonder what your thoughts are uh, on the likewise role of those themes in embedding resilient housing in communities as well. So I'll go to you in order of Heather, Sean and, and Tammy. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would completely agree that yeah, we need to embed um, that kind of whole place approach that I talked about because I think that is, you know, we've got lots of lots of drivers around health or you know the carbon challenge to be net zero carbon by 2045. What does that really mean? And I think you know planners are the custodians of you know thinking about that whole place approach and how we convene. And I think tools like the play standard is a good way to generate, you know, the conversation and get people to think about, you know, how do all these things join up together? And um, what, you know, planners are quite naturally good at thinking about these different connections between them. But I think we have to use these tools. And I think, um, you know, I've never heard of a situation where by using the play standard, it created worse outcomes. You know, I think the more we get, the more we gather views from a wide range of people, I think the more enriched our, our process and plans are. Thank you. And I'm just thinking, Sean, before I come to you, I should explain a little bit more about what I'm talking about. So the Play Standard tool is a tool that's being used in Scotland a lot as an engagement tool prepared by a partnership between Scottish Government and what was NHS Health Scotland. Um, but the themes behind that sit behind it were all very well evidenced, drawn from the World Health Organisation and have now been endorsed by the World Health Organisation. So what a number of organisations are suggesting is that these very themes be embedded in our new national planning framework. Apologies, Sean, for not explaining that. I'll pass over to you now. No, oh, thanks, thanks, Irene. I was um, broadly aware, but the extra detail was very helpful. So thank you. And, and that sounds like a like a great move, doesn't it? A uh, little step forward if that if that actually um, transpires. Um, I think the question was around what's stopping us building in a more resilient way. Um, and of course, there's a long list potentially of reasons um, for that uh, or challenges that we all need to overcome, and we we will need to overcome them all. But I'm just going to try and focus in on planning 
and, and, and planners. Um, and I think for me, it's I think our I think our plans and our approaches to planning over the last I don't know how long years um, have become more um, aligned with the delivery of floor space and the delivery of unit numbers. Um, and there's been a parallel with that about you know some really great urban realm and and and, and public spaces. But I think fundamentally what's missing is this kind of human centric approach. It's about putting health and the person back at the beginning and at the center. So for, for us, one of the things that we are really trying our, our, our hardest to do is when we're getting involved in master planning projects, for example, is making sure that resilience, both in terms of health resilience and climate resilience, is chapter one, not chapter 13. And we'll all remember a time which wasn't that long ago where sustainability um, as, a, as a subject matter, anything to do with the environment really was sort of pushed maybe towards the end of a document. Well, I think we just need to flip that and instantly and make sure that we start with, do we understand the resilience of a place and the pressures and challenges that it's facing and the people are facing there? Um, yes, we do. Now we can move on and begin to plan for the future. But until we've got that baseline, I think we're potentially building on um, unsteady ground. Pass over to you. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Heather on the whole place approach and, and Sean on the, the human centric approach there. And I think it's it's probably also needs to be a sort of stakeholder wide approach and looking for what are the positive things that stakeholders of all types can bring to the table and bring to the conversation. Um, I think that a couple of things that are stopping us building resilient places now are with with how we go about operating the planning system i think one of them's in not everywhere but in a lot of places there's a fairly piecemeal approach to development and that comes from the way in which we release land the pattern of land release and the timing of land release over time means you get a bit of new development here and there over time and then a bit later on um, within the plan and then equally you get pressure on other sites that are in the plan um, and I think another thing that's stopping is is that we've still got relatively limited positive intervention by public sector in bringing plans to life and bringing sites forward. And I know there's a big focus on that now in some authorities and also through the Scottish Land Commission. And I think that will be very positive and has a lot of opportunity. But where we are now, we rely very heavily on private sector home builders to deliver plans. And we could bring them into the fold more when we're making those plans, when we're looking at deliverability and also when we're looking at how do you maximize the public benefit of that development if you set it not set it fully free but if you set it a little bit more free and, and make more opportunity from margaret douglas um, so we we're today um, and all week we're talking about the impact on health um, and well-being. Now, for me, well-being means you're looking at people and planet, the health of both. But do we see that when we're looking at outcomes around health and climate and resilience, are there tensions there um, between attending to do both or do they knit together? But if you see any tensions, then how do you feel we can resolve that? Uh, again, I'll, I'll go to Heather um, and then Tammy and then Sean, just to mix it up a bit. I mean, I think they knit together. I think you can look at, you know, climate change and place as overarching themes, as kind of Sean mentioned, um, and that by doing that, you actually help with health and well-being. Um, I think in some of the transition that we have in terms of thinking about carbon, net zero carbon, how we reduce our carbon efficiencies, we have to be thinking about health and well-being so we're not disadvantaging people. You know, getting rid of cars overnight could disadvantage people, but actually how do we put the stepping stones in place to make sure people can live well and climate resilient when we think about, you know, a shift from um, to electricity and potential kind of spikes in electricity pricing. We need to be thinking about fuel poverty and not, um, you know, thinking about, you know, people being disadvantaged in that way. So I think there are, um, you know, aspects that might have tensions. But if we think again about this whole place approach, I think they do knit well together. And I think as I kind of set out, climate change being a kind of key driver, because 
that won't go away. You know, resilience and climate planning is something that will stay for the next, you know, three decades as planners. So actually, we have to be thinking about how do we just build that into the mainstream of what we do. Thank you. Yeah, over to Tammy. The only time it's going to cause tensions is if we try and start from the site up or an individual development up and try and tick every box within that site at a particular time. I mean, I think time and, and time again, we've seen that can't work. But individual sites and developments can all knit together um, behind a strategy that's designed on a whole based approach with all those themes and concepts in mind. And um, something I think it's important to remember when we're thinking about health and well-being and the impacts of planning there as well, is that you don't just get impacts from doing something, you get impacts from not doing something as well. So as long as, you know, it would, I would say as long as you are not building enough homes, you're going to cause health tensions from that as well, whether that's, you know, mental health tensions and the people that are struggling to get on the housing ladder or get affordable housing or, or others. So, yeah, I do think they knit well together but you've got to take it from a very strategic high level starting point. Sean, I'll pass to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe it's tied to taking a slightly different um, approach to answering the question. And I agree with what, what um, Heather and, and Tammy just said. And I mean, I'm intrigued by this notion that um, planet and human health are, you know, totally interconnected and interdependent. Um, we need obviously both, um, uh, both planetary health and human health really to have a, a good existence. Um, and the link between, um, our, you know, our physical health and, and planetary health, I think, I think is obvious. And most people kind of, you know, understand that pretty I think what's really interesting for me is this one is this question of mental health, because I think we really ought to focus a little bit more than we are doing at the moment on mental health and making sure that places are uh, um, create good environments for good mental health, because without good mental health um, and without being, you know, focused and conscious about the kind of things that we are doing and the things that we need to do in the future, how can we really tackle, you know, the other problems that we're having so probably not my most um articulate answer that one but i think a focus on mental health along with air quality um are two starting points in a in a spectrum of i mean some some of us get sometimes a little bit over you know uh, vexed by the numbers of things that need tackling almost feels like at the same time but for me air quality and, and mental health if we can make a good start on both of those, I think other things begin to follow. Thank you. I, I wonder within that, and, and a little bit flowing into another question there about, you know, we've talked a little about an obsession with housing unit numbers rather than with actually sustainable communities and sustainable housing. I wonder from both of you, what do you feel is a more of an emphasis on the sweet spot that was discussed yesterday about, you know, the way that we create a community that's resilient is and, and healthy and is thinking about physical and mental health is is to have a more walkable community and the way of achieving that and getting the mix of uses and getting the mix of services and the connections the active travel connections that we would like is to get the right density levels and the right mix of housing types so if we you know get that middle point of housing density and ensure that it's not a monoculture of um family housing with gardens absolutely fine that we have that but if we think of the areas across scotland that are that people desire to live in they're a complete mix of family homes colonies tenemental flats that if we if we looked for that mix of housing types and, and and a certain middle point in density how much do you think that could deliver around sustainability as well as that mental and physical health as well and um, i'll go to tammy first and then sean and then back to heather at that point I think, I mean, there's a huge range of housing in Scotland and, and much of that range is always going to come from the housing that we've got, not the few homes that we, we add to the stock every year. 
But when you're adding new homes to the stock, I think the starting point or one of the starting points has got to be what are people who are looking for a home now looking for? And, you know, we don't always have a COVID pandemic on our hands, thank goodness, but we do at the moment. And people are starting to make lifestyle choices on the back of that. And that's a pattern that will likely change for a while. So I think that you do need to think about how the type of homes we have and where they are drive human behavior, but not at the expense of allowing humans to continue making the choices they've always been allowed to make up till now about where they want to live in and the type of house they want to live in. And I think trying to force that through a few homes a year, you know, it's not it's going to build into the mental health issue that, that Sean's talked about or that, that I mentioned about earlier. We've got to deal with what you can achieve from what's happening. You can't always achieve everything just through looking at, at new development. Those things are already important. But I think that a house in itself is the smallest unit of place. And until everybody is able to have that unit of place for themselves and give themselves that secure home, so many people are not going to be able to engage in the concept of the 15 minute neighborhood or worry about whether they walk or get the bus to the shop. They're not going to be able to cope with those concepts until they've got that starting with the home. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is. It's it's an interesting one. And yet when we look at, at where that's been achieved across Scotland, that is where house prices are booming because people do vote with, uh, with their, their wallet and, and want to live there and will pay high value for it. It would be lovely in my my world that we have that in, in every community across Scotland um, so that, that that drive of house prices of people wanting to be there is across all of Scotland and it isn't it isn't driving that anymore. Um, Sean, can I come to you? Of course. Of course. Um, well, I think COVID is changing um, dramatically the housing, the housing market and will change the housing market moving forward. I think even beyond the pandemic and hopefully you know there is a there is a beyond in the in the in the near future what's happening right now is habits are changing you know we're uh, not for everybody um but but for, but for many people habits are changing about where they where they work and how they work uh, and it's also giving giving employers i think options um to do things differently and, and in a more cost effective way and that's going to have some i think dramatic implications for for housing delivery and um, we're already seeing in some of our cities that um you know the the demand or sales of of new residential units in very urban sort of central locations are down and you know state agents in the suburbs and in more kind of rural areas um are kind of run off being run off their feet at the moment with um with bidding bidding wars we're hearing um are happening in in some of our more kind of beautiful parts of the country um so i mean that's creating quite a lot of interesting uh, backdrop isn't it for us as for us as planners so um you know uh, the walkable one of the i think one of the can can i say a positive consequence of one of the things that's happening at the moment that's positive i think is that we're all beginning to walk a bit more we're beginning to explore you know and have done over the last six months or so our neighborhoods and we are understanding, I think, that we can live in a kind of a way which doesn't require the car as often as, as we have done in the past. For many of us, not for all of us. Um, and another positive thing, I think, is around hyperlocalism. I think, as it's being called, which is where you know areas of local shops and local businesses are beginning, are beginning to kind of benefit from from perhaps having more people around uh, d d during the week. Again, there's a difference between what's happening in city centres and what's happening in some sort of smaller towns and suburbs around that. And I think as planners, we've got to find a way of embracing, um, you know, the, the, the change and, and the change in, in, in habits, which are now beginning to become kind of hardwired into, into, into us and into, into the economy. And I think there are some positives. We're talking about walkable, you know, neighborhoods. We're talking about hyperlocalism. We're talking about potential solutions to, to, uh, to, to the dominance of the car. So, I think uh, you know, there's plenty of, of exciting opportunities arising at the moment. Yeah, completely agree, Sean. Um, I'm going, conscious of time. I'm going to pass to you, Heather. Very nice to have you.
ties back to what you were saying about the likes of um, Lerwick and uh, you know that need to retrofit as we have change within our current um, environments, urban environments, um, and also just a little thing around those 20 minutes and, and that. Um, What's coming out of Melbourne is where they have achieved a 20-minute neighbourhood. Um, people are walking 49 minutes a day. Um, where they haven't, people are walking seven minutes a day. Now, the impact on air quality, physical health, mental health all s spill out to us in, in a manner that we don't even need evidence, as you were saying, Sean. Something's just hit you in the face. But, Heather, I shall pass to you for our, our final comment on that question, and then we shall close. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Irene. I mean, I think, um, you know, getting density at the sweet spot is about places. Um, and I think two of the kind of key principles that are emerging from some of the work that we've been doing around carbon conscious places is about, you know, a place that supports more sharing and a place that, you know, reuses and repurposes. And I think when we think about that, what will, how will we live in the future? How will we live? Um, I think sharing facilities or thinking about you know developments that can share certain things and I think Melbourne's got some good examples of you know a modern way of, of co-housing where they're sharing some facilities but they have their own housing um, might be something that we see in the future and I think that reusing of buildings and I think you know we are seeing quite you know some ambitious um, precedents for example Woodside multi-story um, housing uh, blocks in uh, Glasgow just at the canal led by Queen's Cross Housing Association were retrofitted to passive housing standards um, so actually the thought of you know high density in a inner city that can be repurposed and reused for the future I think are kind of two things that sort of sit also with the mix of this. Lovely. I could uh, keep talking about this for another hour, but <laughs> maybe not everybody else shares that passion. So I will I will thank all of you, Heather, Tammy and Sean, for joining us and sharing your expertise. It leads into this afternoon's session at two o'clock, where we'll be going in a little bit deeper on 20-minute neighbourhoods as well. Um, thanks, everyone who's tuned in and, and listened. And um, stay safe, everyone, and goodbye.